Hi, everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 142 for February 17th, 2011. I'm Ryan Trout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. And I'm Josh Walrath. And again, is this is our second week in a row. You were only going to get the three of us. We tried to get a super special secret, uh, top secret guest, but uh, she was stuck at work. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to get Colleen back in here very soon. Uh, it would have been a good day to have her on. We're going to talk uh, quite a bit about some phone and tablety type news uh, involving Android and all that type of stuff. Alan will not be joining us because... Um, well, as Jeremy tried to tell everybody during the pre-show, he was trying to let the magic smoke out of his computer, turned it on, heard like a, I don't know, what did, what did he describe that sound as, Jeremy? He said it was a gunshot pop, oh, it was a, gunshot. a bright light, some smoke, and a smell. He turned it off, and he turned it back on again, and it worked, but he still has no idea what blew up, and he's yeah. So he made it suffered a stroke. <laughs> a TIA, uh, by the way, transient. If the your computer attack. ever makes a shotgun-like sound and has a bright light inside of it, do not turn it back on. Um, if, uh, investigate first before you turn it back on. Uh, Alan's doing this out of necessity. Uh, last week we didn't have him because he was moving. He is still in the process of completing that move. He also has uh, two small children. Uh, one computer was dying. Uh, the um, he has, oh, see, he's trying to finish a review for everybody. So we've got uh, a, a 6 gigabit per second SSD review, which I'm going to go ahead and let that secret slip out, probably by tomorrow morning, right? So make sure you keep checking back, and then we'll obviously talk about it on next week's show. Um, we have a handful of reviews to get to today. Not a whole lot of them were written by people in attendance of this particular episode of the podcast, but we'll run through the high-level uh, of some of these things. The first one being a uh, dual hard drive docking station. Again, nothing super exciting here. This is actually not even a USB 3.0 accessory. I don't think, unless I read these specs wrong. Um, no, USB 2.0 ports. Uh, it does have, so it's, it's, it's built by Zalman. It can hold two 3.5 inch or two 2.5 inch hard drives. It also has uh, two USB 2.0 ports on it, so it's like it acts like a hub. At the same point, or at the same time, it also has, what is that, micro SD and SDHD, or SDXC, whatever those standards are. Um, so it's kind of like a combination memory card reader slash USB hub slash hard drive dock. Connects via USB 2.0 or eSATA. So I know we get emails and questions every once in a while about whether or not the eSATA standard is kind of going by the wayside or I still have some ESATA motherboards of these, you know, still worthwhile getting for. And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, Steve did a pretty good write-up of this. I'm going to cycle here over to the to the performance results. Um, and again, since we're talking about USB 2.0 or ESATA, your, your performance is going to, it's kind of going to vary pretty dramatically. Um, did, did he did run tests? Um, Let's see, what did he say here? Through the HD Tech and HD Tune Pro, speed's pretty much in line with what you expect with eSATA. We're talking somewhere around 100 megabytes per second, and then with USB 2.0, somewhere probably around 30 megs a second. So not incredibly super fast. This is not the super exciting, I don't know if uh, external docks are really that exciting. Although we did, uh, we are giving one away, so make sure you're paying attention to the end of the episode to see if you won this one from last Ooh. week's contest. Um. So that's interesting. Check that out if you're looking for uh, a larger hard drive dock. We also have a review posted by Matthew Smith of the Logitech G13. Have any of you guys tried this or any of these types of, I don't know, targeted gaming accessories? Never held an attraction for me, really. It's And Matt pretty much says the same thing. Yeah, it works, but there's nothing it can do that a keyboard can't. Yeah, so if you're if you're watching the video, you can see some of the pictures of this. It's it's like um, I'm trying to remember the one that was really popular, maybe like five years ago, um, Cyborg or something like that. Yeah, it, that sounds kind of like it. So it's supposed to be more comfortable for your hand. It's arched a little bit, and, and rather than have you know alphanumeric or instead of having just you know letters on the keys, it's got G1 through G22, and you can basically use the Logitech software to slide macros to these. It also has what I thought was going to be really cool was like a thumbstick. Where your thumb is, so it's kind of, you can use it as mouse. 
uh, mouse buttons next to it as well. Um, but yeah, you're kind of right. He tested um, at least a handful of games. He tested World of Warcraft. I think you, you basically can't test an accessory like this without it. World of Warcraft, uh, DC Universe Online. Uh, what else did he get into? Team Fortress 2. So he did some first-person shooter as well. He said basically it was, you know, for the $80 price tag or so, uh, it, it really didn't offer the value that he was hoping it would. Now, he bought this with his own money. We didn't get a sample of this or anything. So it's he obviously didn't feel like it was worth that $80 uh, input. But if, if it's something you're still considering, like you were still kind of looking at, maybe you thought you had a use case for it, go through the review. Uh, it's pretty in-depth in terms of the features that it offers, the software that it offers, and the design of, uh, of the device itself. Boy, 80 bucks for that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's kind of rough. I mean, I've got my stinking Microsoft, <clears throat> what is this thing? The Natural Ergonomic Keyboard 4000, and I bought it for like 35 bucks. The damn thing's lasted for six years. Uh, I got the really yep. expensive uh, Danex. Ooh, nice. That, that, that was about as clean bucks. as mine as well. Well, yeah. If you guys are going to hold your keyboards up at the camera, you should try to clean those off. Um, yeah, well, maybe once a year. Uh, so. It did take longer than this show, I think. <laughs> um, another review, uh, Steve Griever published for us, was a, a, a P67 motherboard review. Now, I know we talked about this last week or a couple weeks ago. We talked about a review that we published as well. These are reviews that we had basically completed or finished or in the, in, in a finish, in the finishing stages of. Um, so they are Sandy Bridge based. You cannot buy this motherboard today. It has been pulled off the market because of the chipset issues that we have talked about uh, seemingly ad nauseum in the last couple of weeks. However, these motherboards are going to be re-released with the updated chipsets. And as far as I can tell from Gigabyte, MSI, ASUS, ECS, um, and probably some others I can't remember off the top of my head real quick, they're, they're going to be releasing many of these, most of these products exactly back into the market as they were before. So basically just swapping the PCB design with the new chip, Boom, out the door. I mean, that's obviously what they're trying to do to get things out the quickest and uh, with the least expense possible. So when this occurs, probably in about four weeks, four to six weeks, you'll still be able to buy this Gigabyte P67A UD4 motherboard, but with um, fewer broken SATA ports, we hope. Uh, regardless, he does a really good job going through the specifications, the layout, uh, the BIOS design. Doesn't have a does not have one of the UFE U. EFI, is that right? Yeah, UF, UEFI BIOS implementations that the ASUS board has. You know, take it or leave it whether or not you think that's something uh, worth waiting for, shelling out any kind of additional money for. Uh, good overclocking results. Go to, the, go to the site, check out that review. Uh, and our last kind of, now that, that's the last of our quick diluge articles. Now, this is kind of the most interesting story of the week, I think, although I might be a little biased since I was the one that wrote it. I want to get, before I kind of, I've been talking for too long straight here as it is, wrote an article called The Upgrade Dilemma, How Your Old Graphics Card Stands Up. Now, there are some caveats to this article. Uh, I'll talk about how uh, some readers commented back to us in emails and, and, and Twitter messages about things that they would have liked to have seen instead. But overall, um, Josh or Jeremy, what... What kind of summary overall take from the story within this article? You go first, Jeremy. Oh, oh, you're you're, you're in the same position I am, aren't you? What, are you trying to read it now or something? Uh, well, yeah, I kind of didn't have. Oh, time okay. In to that case, it. I can go first. I actually <laughs> read oh, it. Go for it. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, so he fired. Took the 9800 GTS or is the GTS Plus? I can't remember. GTX. GTS. GTX. X like is in cross X X W X Y Z. C. Anyway, yeah, that uh, that thing's been around for ages. Uh, first introduced as the 8800 GT, mm-hmm. and uh, you know now we're we're looking at video cards that. Uh, essentially outperform it at the $100 mark. And so, yeah, this is kind of a good time to, to take a look and see where that sits in, in performance with a lot of these new games. And certainly this is still a DX10 card and right. not DX11. But, uh, you know, if, if you look at the specifications, you've got, uh, what, 128 stream units. They're all DX10. Um, 
It's a 256-bit memory bus, but it's all DDR3 still. Right. Uh, you know, and then the speed is is not bad for it. I think you've got you know a few more ROPs, obviously. But if you go to the hundred dollar mark and you get a GTS 450, you get like 50 percent more shaders that are clocked higher. Uh, you've got you know one gig of, of memory standard, and because it's GDDR5, uh, you've got the same amount of memory bandwidth, and uh, <clears throat> you know they're they're pretty comparable overall. But the uh, the GTS 450 is a lot. You know, it's maybe not a lot better, but it's it's significantly better, and that's kind of amazing to consider because you know back in three years ago, this was you know still considered somewhat of a, of a high end card. Oh yeah. Uh, before well, you know, the, we got into the the 9800 GTX was released in April of 2008, um, so almost three years ago, and. It was basically a rebranding with slightly higher clocks of the 8800 GTS that was released in December of 2007. Uh, so that kind of puts it in a, you know, a, a gentle time frame there, uh, or a, gen- a general time frame of where this card is. Now, the reason I started this article was most of the questions, not most, but a lot of the questions we get in here and on This Week in Computer Hardware is, uh, here's my graphics card, or here's my processor, should I upgrade? And it's it's always like, well, are you happy with where your games are at today, the games you want to play? Are you happy with where they run? Uh, if the answer is yes, um, then maybe not. Or you know, are, are, have you even seen what kind of visual and quality differences you can get by enabling 4X anti-aliasing if you can't do that on some games today? The ones I actually ran benchmarks against were a little bit higher price than the GTS 450. Uh, I did the GTX 560 Ti, which is about $235, $250. The Radeon HD 6970 2 gig card, $369. And even the GTX 580, which is $499. So there's kind of, we started, if we start at the $250 range, there's a $120 step up to the next card and a $120 step or so up to the third card of the comparisons. You know, what's interesting is I went back and I looked at the review from April of 2008 of the 9800 GTX, and the games that we used in that review were Bioshock, Company of Heroes, Call of Duty 4, Call of Juarez, Lost Planet, World in Conflict, Unreal Tournament 3, and Crisis. Um, for this article, were you going to say something? And still nothing plays Crisis really well. No, I don't think anything's ever going to. Uh, for this one, we looked at Metro 2033, Lost Planet 2, Civilization 5, F1 2010, Bad Company 2, Left 4 Dead 2, and uh, 3D Mark Vantage. And so we basically ran the 9800 GTX through all of those titles, compared them to these other graphics cards. Uh, but there, as, you, as Josh was mentioning, it's a DX10 GPU, so there were some things that we couldn't really do. For example, Metro 2033... Uh, we definitely ran DX11 modes with all of the other DX11 capable graphics cards. We weren't able to do that with the 9800 GTX. Also, I think that same thing happened with Lost Planet 2, uh, Civilization 5, Bad Company 2. So uh, F1 2010 and Left 4 Dead 2 were the two titles that both ran in DirectX 9, so you're getting pure apples to apples there. Um you know, I'm not going to run through all the benchmarks. The worst one was by far Metro 2033. Uh, the 90, at 19 by 12, the 9800 GTX got a whopping average of like 3.6 frames per second compared with the uh, GTX 560 Ti that got 33.2 frames per second. So an order of magnitude performance difference there. Obviously uh, not playable at those quality settings, period. Uh, and in fact, Metro 2033 was so far weighted towards the new graphics cards that even when uh, I just I turned everything down to their lowest possible settings in the uh, menu at 19 by 12, the 9800 GTX really couldn't keep up. I, I think it's more of a frame buffer issue than anything. 512 is just not enough for that particular game. Lost Planet 2 wasn't too bad. Uh, Civ 5 saw pretty good performance boost from all these new cards. Uh, F1 2010. Uh, pretty noticeable performance boost. We're talking like uh, almost 2x going from the 9800 GTX to the 560 Ti again. Um, that's the one I'm kind of referencing to because it's the lowest cost of the three extra cards we tested. 
one of my most interesting ones was Left 4 Dead 2. So here's a game that's kind of old. It's not the game itself is not incredibly old and outdated, but the engine, I think we would all have to admit, the uh, uh, source engine is well past its prime. Uh, I don't know. It hasn't gone through really any significant upgrades, I want to say, since uh, what was um, Half-Life 2 Lost Planet. Was that when they first introduced HDR and that type of stuff? I think so. Oh, Lost Coast? One. Yes. Lost yeah. Coast. Lost Coast. There you go. Um, what was interesting about that is 19 by 12, 4XAA, 16 anti, uh, 16XAF. Yes, the 560Ti was twice as good a performer as the 9800 GTX, but the 9800 GTX still pulled out sev- over 70 frames per second with a minimum of 40, creating a completely you know playable gaming experience uh, with that almost three-year-old graphics card. And when we, you know, more than three years old, if we look at the architecture itself. Um, so that was that's kind of interesting, and that kind of goes to show that if if you're if you're playing Counter Strike, if you're playing Left 4 Dead, if you're playing some of these older titles, uh, and you don't really have uh, the desire to move up to stuff like Bulletstorm or Metro 2033 or Crisis 2 when it comes out next month, uh, then you know your graphics card options are probably okay as they are, and that's one of the reasons why. 3D Vision is is being pushed out. Why Infinity and Nvidia Surround are pushed out because these, you know, Nvidia and AMD don't make any money while you hold on to that 9800 GTX or that Radeon 3800. They want you to have to buy new graphics cards. So PC gamers are disappointed, and and PC gamers like Jeremy are disappointed in the fact that it, we seem to have become a console dominated gaming world where graphics on the PC aren't pushed nearly as far. We don't have as we don't have many, if any crisis games anymore where you know you have that stigma of wow can any system even play this um well, what you mean the game that came out as a demo on the uh, xbox first and the pcs don't even have a demo yet oh for crisis 2 yeah 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 exactly march 1st it does come out i did see today um but you know because of that people are less I don't know, less likely to upgrade their graphics cards, and that's obviously kind of affecting NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, one of the things I did try to show also on the last page is kind of a visual quality differences you get by upgrading from uh, a DX10-capable card to a DX11-capable card. There's not anything really huge and dramatic that I could find in the real-world gameplay in these titles, right? There's a lot of demos that AMD and NVIDIA will show us and show you about the differences that DX11 can make. Um, but one of the things I was talking about was like in Metro 2033, even with everything turned all the way down, we still could make it playable. If you look at the screenshots on that last page, you know, the um, uh, the DX9 or the, the, the GTX 9800 GTX card on there has significantly less lighting effects. It does create a, a visual quality difference that is separate from whatever performance differences you might see. Um, so... I don't know. I mean, anybody else have any kind of thoughts on this? We, you know, Alan's not on here, but he would he he doesn't play a lot of PC games. Would be my guess right now. But he is still of that mindset. He still has a GeForce GTX 260, you know, plus. I think right. So, what what are I mean, what are your kind of thoughts on the results of this or the idea of of the the length of time users are keeping their graphics cards nowadays? Yeah. Well, now that I've had a chance to read the article, I. Uh, I mean, I just went through this not too long ago. I went with 6950 because I knew you could pretty much turn it into a 6970 guaranteed if you're willing to put that little bit of extra effort into it. But they're doing a pretty good job at adding new features to games. Uh, there's a lot of bling sparklies that you're going to get on a PC with a higher end video card through DirectX 11, through just about... Uh, even DirectX 10 for a lot, because a lot of people are still on DirectX 9. You know, right. why bother upgrading into Vista, because that was just unpleasant. Or, and a lot of people just don't want to jump to 7, because, hey, they've been using the same operating system for almost a decade now. Why bother moving up? Why bother about upgrading your video card? If you're looking at upgrading the operating system, though, then all of a sudden the video card becomes a lot more point, uh, or important because what's the point in having a DX9 compliant or even a DX10 compliant card mm-hmm. when you're running 7? Yeah, you know, DX11 true. has noticeable visual differences. I mean, most people aren't playing a game to, you know, sightsee. They're too busy blowing up people and showing them their own entra- entrails. But right. 
you know, there are games like Civ V, which shouldn't have been as pretty as it was, but hey, it's fun to look at. And when you're replaying, because I mean, I know the, the college gamers, guys with a lot of disposable income, will play Halo through 18 times to unlock whatever. Right. They're going to start yeah, to notice, true. hey, this looks a little bit better. <laughs> and I hate to say it, but that's sort of the target market for the PC gamer now. Yep. Agreed. Um, now, the some of the comments I've got back, mostly it was all positive. Yeah, this it's, it's a good article. Uh, helped me out a lot. One of the some of the complaints I got, Josh, were that it was unfair to do this type of comparison because I was using a, a high end Core i seven. 965 processor with you know six gigs of memory and this is not um, the the true story because a user that has a 9800 GTX probably doesn't have a Core i7 processor. What kind of performance benefits would they get moving from the 9800 GTX on say an Athlon X2 or X3 or X4 to a 560 Ti or a a GTX 580 something like that? And uh, my my thought was. Games are still GPU limited, especially these newer games. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, you are going to see a performance hit a little bit, but it's not going to be anything extreme. I mean, a 9800 GTX, uh, you know, is hitting four frames per second on Metro 23, even on an Athlon 2, you know, an Athlon 2X2 or whatever. Uh, you're still going to get at least triple that with even a, a any kind of better video card and not even, you know, Probably more than triple. I mean, you're talking going to 25 to 30 frames per second with just that kind of gaming CPU. Right. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard not to hold on to some video cards. I mean, I've got a big old stack behind me anyway, just because I, I'm a pack <laughs> rat. And right. a lot of people are are the same, and and not everybody has the luxury of say like you or I that you know we get some uh, new GPUs in, we we can sure. review them. And then slap them in our machine after a couple of months of of them being on the test bench. Um, it's still, but it's you, you got to kind of weigh out where performance is now and how much that performance costs. I mean, it, you can get four times what an eighty eight hundred GTX uh, puts out uh, for one hundred and fifty bucks, if even that, and so. We're getting to the point where these prices are just so cheap, you might as well upgrade. I mean, even if you don't want to upgrade your motherboard, memory, or, or processor anymore, it's just so cheap and so easy to get a huge performance boost from a couple-year-old card by spending 100 to 150 bucks. And I think that uh, you know that's something that everybody should walk away with from this review. I I personally would have liked to have seen you had like you know an HD 5770 as well as a GTX. Mm-hmm. 460, you know, just two extra cards, but I realize that's, that's still a bunch of work when, when you're going through, you know, so many damn benchmarks. Um, but uh, I think that's, you know, what a lot of people are, are kind of looking at. Sure, these Halo parts of the 6970 and the GTX 580, uh, you know, most, most people don't go out and drop 360 to, to 500 bucks on, on a car just on a whim. But if they're walking through Best Buy or they're going through Newegg and they see a special on something that's 130 bucks or 150 and they kind of look, you know, slyly at their computer and, and see that G92 based card sitting in there just humming away, uh, right. it gets awful tempting. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it was a good article for the time and, uh, you know, people can go through. And, uh, you know, kind of cross-reference uh, the performance on some of these lower-end cards. And uh, sure, certainly, you know, your platform does make a difference. But when you're starting to get at decent resolutions and, and uh, you know, decent AA uh, quality um, and, and overall quality settings, um, your CPU becomes less and less important. I mean, if you've got something that's three years old, it's still going to be able to push that card pretty well. I mean, not as mm-hmm. good as, you know, an i7 that's six cores running at 3.6 gigahertz, uh, but it's still going to do pretty well. Yep. All right, uh, we're going to get to a bunch of little news stories here. We've got some voicemails and some emails to get to, of course. First, we'll take a quick break and thank today's podcast sponsor. All right, thanks, MSI, for that. Now, uh, some interesting news bits, some funny commentary first. AMD sent over, uh, Josh was enormously jealous because it included candy. 
Uh, and yes. it, supposedly, it was supposed to be a mug as well. Unfortunately, my mug. mug was shattered. It was a jigsaw puzzle. Pieces. Yeah, it definitely was a jigsaw puzzle that required super glue. Uh, but mm-hmm. AMD is kind of, um, I think when the Intel chipset thing first happened, we talked on, on this show about uh, ne- AMD really kind of needing to take advantage of it, even though they didn't have any new products to release. They didn't have any uh, you know, real improvements in their product stack because of it or anything like that. And when you know, we're not at bulldozer and we're not at Lano or anything, they needed to take the advantage while they had the upper hand while Intel can't sell anything and try to promote and market and get new customers uh, moving into that. We actually have an email asking about sockets and that type of stuff with AMD going in the future. But they, for Valentine's day, they sent out these little notes you can see here on the screen, it reads, uh, Dear Ryan, I heard that Sandy B broke your heart and wanted to let you know that I'm here for you. Oh, and I have a cousin from Lano, Texas I'd like you to I'd like to introduce you to soon. I think you two will really hit it off. XOXO AMD Fusion APU. And then there was a uh, coffee mug that said I Heart APU and the AMD logo and little chocolates inside of it and that type of stuff. Um, I thought it was really funny. I thought it was pretty cute. Uh, obviously, they are taking a jab at Intel while they're down. Um, you've got to make sure you do it while the, the beast is down and it can't quite get up yet. So AMD will have a four-week at least head start to run away in the other direction. But I think this, plus they're, they're beginning to market uh, that their AMD Phenom 2 more to the enthusiasts. Uh, you know, get a customer into your market now. They're more likely to stay with you uh, into the future. I mean, Josh, is this something you think they should be doing as well, or do you think really they should be kind of holding back, saving their money, waiting so they have something like Bulldozer to really time to kind of push forward? Uh, you know, get people talking about you. Uh, that's that's the name of the game. Uh, if, if Intel can't yeah. deliver, you come back and, and you say, hey, this is what we have. And uh, like I think I mentioned to you, you know, they, they should have something like, uh, you know, some cheesy-ass commercial coming out. We like hard drives. You like your hard drives. That's why we made motherboards that don't seem to lose them. You know, just <laughs> go off on something yeah. that uh, will just, you know, hit them below the belt because the game is, is not fair. And uh, get people to talk about you. You know, say, hey, we've got six-core processors that we had a special on our 1100T that was uh, 200 bucks at Tiger Direct last week. Um, that's an, still it's actually 200 uh, pretty, bucks everywhere right now. Yeah, it's it's just yeah. an amazing, amazing price for you know a pretty good processor. You can game, you can video encode, you can do everything you really want to, and uh, do it nearly as effectively as most i7s and Sandy Bridges. I mean, those are going to be faster in a lot of other things, but not right. significantly so. And plus, you've got a very, very large selection of uh, SB850 based motherboards on the AMD side that, you know, while not overwhelming IO performance, is still a big step up from their previous ones, and they continually work. And you've got six SATA 6G ports on it, and Intel yep. has nothing like that. And so AMD really needed to get on this. I mean, they should have had a meeting that morning and started getting advertising things uh, out to, to publishers. You know, by that afternoon, that's just hammering on this. But they 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 took a little bit more relaxed of a way to do it, and uh, you know we're finally starting to see some stuff. But boy, it it took them a long time. And when you're dealing with Intel, you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. And you don't have a whole lot of time to to get, get your message out without you know them coming down like a like a ton of bricks, whether it be right. marketing money or or performance or or whatever. So. Yeah, they needed to jump on this a whole lot more than than they did. Agreed. Um, One of the other things that I saw this week, this wasn't produced by AMD, or if it was produced by AMD, they did it completely in an underground method. They didn't have any kind of branding on this, but there's a YouTube video that we published. uh, Hopefully, Burke will bring it up here. um, That compares the uh, chipset, the Sandy Bridge chipset issue of Intel to the uh, engineering disaster that was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, um, which if you've never seen video of this, then you've probably never been to an engineering school. And this is why you'd always double check your math on things. Um, this is where the bridge had oscillated until it collapsed uh, in only a 40 mile an hour wind, a steady 40 mile an hour wind. And the audio that goes along with this is pretty good as well. It's just a very foreboding music. 
Yeah. The Valkyries are coming for you. <laughs> yeah. It so it it it's definitely it, um, it, it's, it's definitely over the top, right? So they, they mentioned Sandy Bridge a lot. They don't necessarily mention it's not the processor, that it's the chipset. To most general consumers, they don't really care. They just know that their system is broken or will be broken or needs to be recalled or uh, they can't buy the system that they were hoping to buy. Um, I've answered a lot of questions from you know people on Twitter or Facebook that have said, you know, well, I guess because of this, the laptop I wanted to buy for this show or this birthday or this specific event is going to be delayed. And yeah, more likely that's the case. But um, this kind of, you know, that kind of video and that kind of marketing just kind of shows you uh, what some people are making out of the deal. Uh, I did kind of comment at the end of that post that I would, I would wager to say that the, the response has been more timid than I expected. Uh, I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with this. I feel like um, I expected enthusiasts to be up in arms with Intel about this, to really be bashing them more, to really be, you know, siding with AMD, to really kind of like starting this kind of, I don't know, enthusiast, consumer, DIY or revolution. It's not really happening. It seems to be like most people are just kind of like, eh, it's Intel. They make the best stuff, so they'll fix it and we'll be okay. Yeah, well, but how many of the enthusiasts still have, you know, X58-based boards or, you know, P57-based uh, boards that they're running happily their uh, their Core i7 uh, last-generation stuff? So, I mean... Yeah, Intel didn't lead with their enthusiast line. These are the mid-range. True. The early True. adopters for that range, you know, it's probably a budget gamer looking for the best sort of thing. In which case, they're not really storage geeks. Two SATA 6 ports are going to be enough for them. Yeah, I'm sure they're that's probably the just case. thinking, hey, I get a shiny new motherboard in a couple of months, so they're not complaining. Now, you, you wrote a little news piece, Jeremy, uh, about a report from Digitimes saying that we were already to the point of seeing uh, first shipments of these chipsets to motherboard manufacturers. Is that right? That's what they're saying, is that the Valentine's gift for uh, MSI, Gigabyte, at Asus, and the rest from Intel was they were shipping out uh, B3 boards. So, or, or sorry. Well, they were shipping out B3 chipsets. The B3 chipset was first coming onto mass, mass production. So they're figuring by Monday next week, they're actually going to be starting to ship them in small quantities, uh, presumably for the trade-back programs that uh, all of these motherboard companies have adopted for their early adopters. Mm -hmm. uh, Gigabyte for sure, Asus for sure, or Asus for sure. MSI wasn't named, but I'm betting that they're in it as well. <coughs> so we're yeah. looking at April, full swing, back in the channel. You're going to start seeing it in retail again. I'm actually hearing rumors now that uh, some of these board vendors are going to have Boards ready to send out to customers middle of March, uh, a couple of weeks earlier than they expected, thanks to a maybe quicker release from Intel, if that's part of it. Maybe this Digital Times report kind of backs that up as well. So yeah. that would be good news. In uh, another part of the world, there we are, I guess it's in Spain, one of the largest, if not the largest, cell phone event in the world is happening, the Mobile World Congress. Uh, from there, we have lots and lots of SOC news, lots of uh, mobile phones, lots of tablets, like lots of uh, operating systems types things. We're going to talk about the NVIDIA quad-core part with Josh here in a second. But a couple of quick notes here. <clears throat> uh, Ken has done a really good job getting some news stories from the event up on the site. Uh, first, Samsung announced a new Galaxy S family of mobile devices, including the Galaxy T uh, Galaxy S2 phone, which has a dual-core processor, but it is not the NVIDIA Tegra. I think uh, this is actually a Samsung-built SoC. It has a gig of memory on there, so that's uh, pretty, pretty impressive from a hardware perspective. Super AMOLED screen, all that type of good stuff, Android 2.3. They also announced the Galaxy Tab 10.1, um, is, but this, this device is actually going to be using the NVIDIA Tegra 2 platform. So, uh, again, dual core, uh, honeycomb, Android 3.0 interface, uh, various 
interesting looking devices. There was this last thing, the Galaxy S Wi-Fi seems kind of like an iPod Touch competitor. No 3G connectivity, Wi-Fi only. Uh, has a one gigahertz Hummingbird core, single core processor, uh, as you expect there. They they seem to be labeling it as an Android device for media playing and web surfing and that kind of stuff. Uh, hopefully. They're going to improve the media player in Android if that's going to happen. As anybody that has an Android phone knows that the media player app on Android, that's the stock Android, or even the HTC or the, or the Samsung phones is really, really not very good. Uh, really? Other kind of interesting news. What's that? Really? Can you not put anything else on a, an Android phone or you're stuck with uh, whatever they give you? There, I mean, there are other music players, um, but, you know, most, of the, most consumers are really going to stick with whatever – comes out of the box, right? Uh, so it's, it, it's for me personally, I still I have my HTC Evo, uh, but I still carry around a Microsoft Zune, uh, one of the new ones, be, the Zune HD, because I really, really, really like the interface that it has, how easy it is to get between music and videos and podcasts and all that type of stuff. Um, and Microsoft really, really appreciates you, your, your customer service because not too many people there's, bought those Zunes. There's not a lot of us. There's not a lot of us. I know a lot of people that have the Zune Marketplace. They subscribe uh, to the Zune, fourteen dollars a month for all you can eat music, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, not a lot of people with the actual music players themselves. Other news from the show: Nokia drops Symbian, adopts Windows Seven as its main kind of smartphone operating system. This is really, really a big deal for Nokia, who's the largest cell phone manufacturer in the world. Still, not in the U.S., but in the world. Uh, could be a big boon for the uptake of Microsoft's Windows Phone 7 interface. Uh, not a whole lot of hardware news in there, though. HTC also announced another Android tablet, or I'm sorry, they announced an Android tablet at Mobile World Congress running, uh, I guess this is also a Tegra device. No, this is not a Tegra device because uh, it's only running uh, Android 2.3, so it's not actually using a 3.0. Um, seven inch screen, 1.5 gigahertz dual core tablet, but not Tegra design again there. So there's tons and tons of tablets, tons and tons of phones, uh, of, uh, decoding all of the news and stuff throughout the weeks as these releases come forward. Now, uh, interesting news from NVIDIA kind of on the last day of the show, something that I think Josh and most other people would agree was, was, was a surprise announcement considering Tegra 2 really kind of made its first unveiling at CES just last month at uh, in January. We're st- and we still really, I, I guess I don't want to say we haven't. I, I want to say we haven't seen any Tegra 2-based products actually released and are for sale today. We're very, very close. Maybe something happened in the last week or so that I didn't uh, recognize. But that And that is the first dual-core ARM-based uh, SOC. Now they have announced quad-core parts uh, appropriately named Cal-L. I say appropriately because NVIDIA wants to call everything a super phone and anything that's using Tegra uh, at Mobile World Congress, they're calling a super tablet as well. Uh, There wasn't a whole lot of information here, Josh, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what the quad-core release here of Tegra uh, kind of showed us, whether or not you think their timeframes of August product availability make a whole lot of sense, things like that. (laughs) You know, it does, because uh, apparently this is A0 silicon. This, this is the st- first stuff off of the line that they got. Mm-hmm. It's, it's their quad core. They've, uh, they, they, I, th- I believe they added uh, dual core Tegra. Is they didn't have that kind of SSE unit, the, I think Neon MBA, I believe that ARM uh, is, is calling it. That it's you know it's the multiple uh, you know input data output uh, stuff for floating point a lot of good multimedia things. Um, the Tegra two doesn't have that. Cal L does, and it's mm-hmm. a quad core. It's a forty nanometer part. Uh, a lot of people were not expecting to see any quad cores until twenty eight nanometer. But apparently, ARM has done such a good job in power gating and their design that for most applications, it's going to shut down those extra cores, and uh, you're going to get as good as power performance as the Tegra 2 because, uh, you know, the Tegra 2 has been in the design for quite some time, and it really was only released, you know, recently, but apparently they were able to discover some other, you know, power-saving functions uh, that they could implement into the design, 
and they did this with with Cal L. So they said in in most applications, you're going to see a little bit better performance and just about the same power consumption, even though it's a quad core. Mm-hmm. But when you really need that extra power, um, it's gonna it's gonna jack up. It's gonna have all four of those cores. It's gonna have the better graphics, uh, and, and you're gonna see you know a lot better performance. But whether or not your battery life is is going to suffer dramatically, uh, it's 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 a big question right now. But again, uh, this is twelve day old silicon that they're actually running and showing, and this is kind of unheard of. That's pretty uh, impressive. Especially, yeah, especially since uh, the the graphics portion is an extended version of uh, what we saw in Tegra two. I mean, it's it's instead of the eight units that they have, which were the uh, four pixel shaders, four vertex shaders, they've got twelve. They didn't tell us how they divided those up, but my guess is is probably they they keep the four vertex shaders and and have you know eight eight, eight pixel shaders shaders running at, at slightly higher speed. So and you think so the, you've the, got what what. What are the, so explain to me and, and everybody listening, I guess, what you think the 12 core NVIDIA GPU actually means? Because I, I, when I heard 12 core, I thought immediately of uh, 12 shaders, like 12 unified shaders, but that's not the case. Yeah, because with Tegra 2, it's an 8 core. Uh, okay. Four of those cores are are considered pixel shaders. The other four are are the vertex. So I'm thinking gotcha. they probably just doubled the uh, the pixel pixel shader power. And kept the vertex about the same because you know most applications just are, are they're not vertex limited. They're rather you know especially when you're you're going into higher resolution uh, stuff you know and uh, these new screens and, and tablets that that right. they're looking at are going to have you know quite a bit uh, you know higher resolution. Uh, they're going to need to really push the pixels, and so I think they're going to. Do that that way. Um, I think it runs a little faster in, in terms of megahertz. Uh, you know, they've had time to to tweak the design and figure out what's going on. And uh, you know, TSMC has done a pretty good job with their 40 nanometer process as well. So it was really surprising. It's only 12 days old, and if it's running this well, that means they're going to probably make a couple of real small changes, if at that. And they're going to send off large orders to, uh, to TSMC. Uh, mm-hmm. it'll take, you know, two to three months to, uh, to actually manufacture these wafers, you know, another couple weeks to package them. And so an August time frame is, is certainly not, you know, out of the ordinary for where mm-hmm. they're sitting right now, especially with the apparent quality of the chip that first came off of these test lines. So, right. NVIDIA is good shape. They've, they've, you know, were the first out with the dual core, uh, Cortex A9, uh, and they're going to be the first out with the, the quad core and actually shipping to customers. I think that they've really caught, uh, TI and Qualcomm by surprise with how they're doing things and especially with saying, yeah, you can throw this into a smartphone. It's not going to be probably the best application for it because of it. It, it is going to suck more power sure. when you have you know heftier things. But hey, you've got this big old tablet that's you know it's a pound and a half. It's got much bigger battery. It, it's got a better thermal envelope that we can get into. This is going to be a perfect processor for that, and it's going to be at least six months before. The next uh, uh, competitor is going to have anything remotely like this. So, you know, they're, uh, NVIDIA is being very aggressive in a space that typically has not seen this kind of movement. I mean, Qualcomm yeah. and TI, while certainly competent companies, uh, they just didn't push the technology as I think we're seeing what NVIDIA is doing now. I mean, it's they're cutthroat. Yeah, they, I mean... This is what NVIDIA is used to, right? They're used to the GPU market where every 6 to 12 months you have a completely new architecture uh, on, on the field, and they're bringing that to a group of companies and engineers that maybe didn't have that type of pressure on them before. Um, they showed a little bit of their roadmap past Cal-L. So Cal-L is rated at about 5x the performance of Tegra 2. Wayne, which will be out in 2012 promises 10x. Logan, out in 2013, promises somewhere around, I don't know, 60, uh, 50 to 60x, and Stark nearing 100x the performance of Tegra 2. Now, if you're, hopefully if you're a good old-fashioned nerd, you recognize the theme here. These are all, I think, pretty cool comic book-based code names. I can appreciate that a lot more than cities or rivers or 
other things like that. Stars. Yeah, uh, but I do. Streets. I, I do implore Nvidia to please stop using the term "super" when talking about their phones or their tablets. Super. They're not super phones. They're not super tablets. They're just faster phones or faster tablets. Because if they already, yeah, if but they're already super phones, after superheroes, they are super. Well, it's that's stable. true. That's true. But if they're already super tablets with dual cores, when they come out with quad core, what are they going to be? Beyond. Super, really super ones, super duper ones, Uber. extraordinary ones. I'm just saying it's a it's a path we don't want to go down as an industry. I think we need to come up with better terminology for that. Um, so yeah, if you go to that news post, there are a couple of videos of uh, web browsing benchmark, uh, core mark testing on that. Um, yeah, so pretty pretty impressive stuff. Uh, if, I mean, if if they can pull pull it out, that 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 they'll have these products available in August. It's kind of like Ken and I were talking earlier today. You know. Uh, you know, you've got you've got the Galaxy tablet, right? And during Christmas time, I had a lot of people come to me and say, "Hey, I was thinking about getting the Galaxy tablet for my wife, or my husband, or my boyfriend, or whatever." What do you think? And I said, eh, "You know what? It's kind of expensive. I wouldn't buy one yet because I know at CES there's going to be a ton of faster, better tablets announced, and uh, we saw that. And now what we're seeing at uh, you know, Mobile World Congress is these tablets. Motorola Zoom is supposed to be out here at the end of this month. Uh, we're going to see other Tegra 2 based platforms. But now NVIDIA is coming out and saying, hey, but in August, we're going to have quad core tablets ready for you. So it's almost like, I, do I want to buy a tablet in March, even if I think in August there's going to be something better? Um, I'm going to be curious to see how consumers, uh, resellers, uh, 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 the the carriers like Verizon and Sprint and AT and T kind of react to this because it's not something they're used to. You know, you get a phone and probably in a year, maybe two years, it's kind of really outdated. But if if Nvidia keeps up on this kind of uh, rapid change, we're really going to get down to that thing of where by the time a product hit, hits market and gets advertising mainstream, that we're already talking about the next one. Will consumers kind of 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 fall out of love with that design cycle as I think a lot of people have done with the uh, like kind of enthusiast PC graphics hardware market as well. Yeah, they won't upgrade their video card for a couple of years or their phone for a couple of years. Yeah, I I mean, they're going to want to. And that's the issue. It's like where you kind of get, you know, you kind of get into that area where graphics card guys don't want to buy new graphics cards because there's always something better, right? And we try to, you know, on this show, tell them, yeah, but there's always, always going to be something better next, so go ahead and buy when you're ready now. Uh, enthusiasts and DIYers maybe understand that better than the hundreds of millions of people that are going to be using phones and smartphones and that type of stuff in the very near future. So, you know, you're gonna something, say something that's going to make you, oh, go ahead. No, do you no, want me talk? Thank introducing you. you. Introducing you. that is going to pull your eyebrows out. Next up is going to be the extreme tablets. Ooh. Okay. What about what Ex- about what about tablet TI like for titanium? Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. And and in fact, those tablets can then re-enter the atmosphere without burning up. <laughs> nice, uh, Josh yeah. or no, Jeremy. Apparently, oh. Dell wants to buy AMD. Is that is that an accurate statement? You think? Well, um, the conspiracy theorists certainly think so. Uh, the theory is Dirk Meyer just left back in January. Uh, Bob Rivet or Bob Rive, however you want to say it, uh, the chief op- chief operations officer took over his position, but has pretty much flat out stated he has no interest in staying that way. So you got to Thomas company Seifert. that he's the new CEO. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. And so Rivet left. Seifert. Rivet's gone. Yeah. So Rivet's now gone. it's Seifert, and Seifert doesn't want to stay. The others have just left. So Seaford is actually still there, but still isn't looking to continue it. There was a little spike in uh, AMD stocks, which you know always implies insider trading. So the sum of it is that the rumor is that Dell is sort of interested in buying AMD for some reason. I don't get it. Yeah, Dell does have the money to do it, but... You know, they sell a, a product they don't need to get into manufacturing. I mean, come on, AMD got out of the manufacturing part, put that into global foundries, and now it's just sort of design. So now Dell's going to buy a design company that has ties to a production company, and Intel is going to get so mad at them they'd never sell them another Intel processor again. 
Hey, maybe <clears throat> maybe Dell just wants to get out of the desktop market. And this is a way that they can keep the revenue up high and still be in like a server market and maybe a tablet market and have their own phones, but get rid of 90% <clears throat> of, of their yeah. of their Indian Southeast Asia tech support. Okay. Just all gone. So they get rid of the desktop, keep servers that, but they're now making some chips. They don't have to deal with any customers anymore. But then again, Dell is trying to push into the network switch market and, you know, network devices at, you know, the, the fairly big level. We're not talking routers you stick underneath your desk, but power over Ethernet, uh, controllable switches and stuff. So what does AMD have to offer them in that case, whereas Intel is just, you know, sniffed up that uh, security company not too long ago, which was looking at embedding security uh, features into network devices. Right. So Dell yeah. sort of bailing on Intel that way. I don't know. I don't like it. I, it's fun to I, speculate. I, oh, of course. Of course it is. But now, because you got to think of it, Dell would be buying ATI as well, which is obviously AMD now. Uh, I don't know if I want... Dell created GPUs and that type of stuff. You know, processor design, kind of one thing, right? It's going to stay server-based and uh, kind of centric as well. But I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think anybody will ever buy AMD. If anybody buys AMD, it'll probably be that rumor we saw months ago, ATIC, uh, and thereby recombining the manufacturing and design firms. Um, or right, IBM, emails, you know. Yeah. Get back into some emails and uh, voicemails real quickly here. Email address is podcast at pcper.com. Voicemail, one eight 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 thirty eight pc per toll-free U.S. and Canada. You can call us and leave us a message, uh, insult anybody you want. We'll probably even play it. Uh, first email here is going to come from Kyle about the AM3 processor sockets. We'll pass this one over to Josh. Oh, goody. All right. <clears throat> Kyle, AM3 sockets, AM3 CPUs. Although little has been revealed about the next generation of AMD processors, bulldozer, the only thing that is known is that AM3 Plus motherboards will take AM3 processors. In light of the PH67 situation, as you discussed in last week's podcast, some are tuning to AMD for a solution. It seems like AM3 Plus motherboards would be perfect right now. This seems particularly true for OEMs. Configure one system right now, and it's ready for the next several months, perhaps even the remainder of the year. MSI had an AM3 Plus board on display at CES over a month ago, and apparently ASRock has a board based on the 890FX for AM3 Plus. Do you have any further insights as to availability? Uh, you know, this is a very good question because if AMD actually had started, uh, you know, seeding the marketplace with AM3 plus motherboards, which do accept AM3 processors, they could have gotten a foothold in this market and, and had been just a little bit more ahead of the game. But I'm not sure, not entirely sure why, uh, they have delayed the release of AM3 Plus. Well, I don't think it's even delayed. They just didn't plan it to be nearly this early. And so, uh, you know, I would expect to see the first trickle out and perhaps announcements of AM3 Plus uh, motherboards next month, probably end of March. Get ready for, hmm. you know, an April, May time frame for, uh, you know, Bulldozer and uh, Lano parts. Um you know, none of this, the, I'm not under any NDA. <clears throat> I haven't been told anything from AMD or others uh, ever. But from all indications, uh, the, the the chipsets that are going to come out are, are essentially going to be rebranded 800 series with uh, with the potential of, of having a slightly revised SB850. You know, they may call it something like the SB910. I don't know all the details, obviously, uh, but it's not going to be a big jump. And so we do have to ask ourselves, why didn't they get these out and start seeding the market and, uh, you know, really take advantage of, well, you know, nobody can see in the future, at least that I know of, and certainly they didn't expect to tell Sandy Bridge to have this kind of mistake. But still, you'd, you'd think that they would have had a lot of stuff ready to go well before the launch in case of something unforeseen happens. So, you know, I'm, I'm really 
surprised but not surprised by AMD. They used to be a, a, a pretty um, agile company. Uh, they haven't seen very agile for the past five years. No. So, yeah, we're probably going to see these boards soon, but, uh, again, for a lot of OEMs, probably not soon enough. Yeah, it's and it's kind of not soon enough to take advantage of this whole Intel issue, right? We kind of talked about it when this happened, that if they'd had... If they could maybe pull in Bulldozer a couple of months or pull in Lano a couple mm-hmm. of months or a couple of weeks even and pull in these motherboards a little bit and start getting these enthusiasts new product mm-hmm. as well as just existing product with their name on it and getting them talking about that, that would help as well. Oh, we got another, e- another email from Mark here, Jeremy, if you want to read that one. Okay. We've got an email from Mark about uh, VESA and an AMD system. Hello, Ryan and crew. You guys are the best. I'm Mark from San Francisco, California, and I listen to your podcasts every week. I built my first gaming PC last year, and that's thanks to you guys. Hey, I guess we're spreading the love. Uh, And I'll be building my next gaming PC once Sandy Bridge rolls out to the market again. Okay, here's my question. Just bought an HP 2711X monitor, and I love it, but it has no holes at the back for me to mount it to the wall. Are there wall mount solutions out there for this type of LED monitor? Oh, bad on you, HP, for not doing a VESA mount. Mm. Yes, uh, you can build something. It's going to be a little bit clunky. Uh, there are solutions out there with grippers, more or less, that will do it. If you've got a drill and uh, can a nice uh, model, because find another monitor that's got it, make a template, figure out where the holes are, and... Uh, You could try that. I don't know how safe it would be, but you should be able to unscrew the back plate off of the monitor without having to mess with any of the front of it. Yeah. I've never done any of those projects myself, but have you you done something like that? Uh, At work, I've seen essentially it's a slider that you put the monitor into. You use if the buttons are on the bottom, you pretty much lose functionality of the buttons because that's where the metal is holding the monitor up and then right. to sort of a V-shape behind it. And, you know, they're not attractive. I mean, you just sort of wonder, why don't you go out and buy another one? Just look out for a special. Because if you're looking for an upgrade, you can now have two monitors, one which will have the mount on it and one which you can try and finagle into a some sort of a set up with it because if you're looking to upgrade hey dual monitors especially if you go amd nvidia yep a lot of the time you need two cards but amd you can do it on one but he does it with another question all right uh the gaming pc he built last year was a phenom 2x2 555 on an am3 motherboard from asus with uh acc Four gigs of RAM, NVIDIA GTX 570, uh, 700 and watt PSU with a one terabyte hard drive. Oh, saved the CPU up to 400 or to, up to four gigahertz. So yeah, we've definitely had an effect on them. Uh, tried to unlock the two extra cores, but it wouldn't boot. So he's wondering if the CPU is a bottleneck for his GPU. If the GTX 570 is being held back by the X2 555. Mm-hmm. He's playing WoW and a lot of sequels like Dirt 2, Mass Effect 2, Bad Company 2, Starcraft 2. Something else, too. Uh, and he'd be passing the, bro- the PC on to his brother once Sandy Bridge comes out. So we're just wondering if he should swap out the CPU with an X4 or an X6 before he hands it off to his younger brother. Older brother, yes, upgrade, definitely. Younger brother, well, you know what they're for. Nice. I don't know. The X2 is doing probably pretty good. Uh, like if you played Supreme Commander 2, another sequel. Then you'd want to go up to the X4 or the X6, because that does uh, benefit from the multi-core. Some other games, not so much. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say at that speed, it's probably still holding up its, part of, its side of the bargain uh, with that. Yeah. I got nothing else. Yeah, leave it be. Give it yeah. to him. Yeah. Don't spend your money. Maybe he'll right, downclock well, it, make it into a triple core, and be happy. Who knows? Yeah. You want to take our last email of the day, Josh? Sure. Email from JK. Just kidding. About power supplies. I have another question that I think a lot of people have, and I personally find confusing. I want to eventually do either a SLI or Crossfire setup, and I want to get a PSU that will be able to handle the load. 
My question is, what is better, a single 12-volt rail or a PSU with three to four or even six rails? I'd like to get a gold 80-plus certified PSU in the 900 to 1,200-watt range. As for brands, I'm familiar with Thundermax, Corsair, Antec, Cooler Mask, Raid Max, and Thermaltech. If you could pick the top, say, five power supplies in your guys' opinions, what would they be? And would you recommend a single 12-volt rail or multiple 12-volt rails? Thanks again. Keep up the good work. You know, so I've, I've actually kind of gone through this lately. Uh, I've been doing a little bit more research and looking around. And there's actually very little difference in between, uh, you know, having a single large rail as compared to having multiple. I mean, I think that there are, you know, electrically are, are drawbacks and advantages to both. Uh, the advantage to have a, having a single large, you know, powerful rail is that you can use any plugs wherever you want. And, you know, you're not going to go over those 18 or 20 or however many amps that uh, the rail will, will do. Because if you're, you know, have like a 750 watt power supply, you're looking at about 50 amps on a single rail. And so you've, you've got to work pretty hard to, to overcome that. Um, I had just installed uh, the new Antec uh, HCP 1200, I believe, and it's got six or eight rails on that damn thing. Uh, but anymore, they do a really good job in um, saying which rail goes to which plugs. Right and uh, yeah, they label them really well, and you can you can really mix and match those quite nicely to to get a very even uh, type power draw from as many rails as you can. And so it's not like the first multi rail power supply I ever had. Um, I mean, they it was it was garbage for uh, for labeling, and so you really had to mix and match and, and guess and really hope that it was coming out how you wanted it to and uh but but they really have have improved that now um i like this antec 1200 watt uh it it seems to work really well um i like the corsair stuff they just uh, as we'll say you know I'll talk about later uh they they have the new tx versions out uh they look pretty decent so it it depends on your level of comfort but for the vast majority of applications, you're not really going to be pushing a 900 to 1200 watt power supply. Now, say if not you likely. had a 750 watt and you threw in two GTX 480s and you saw your power jump up to, you know, 718 watts at the, at the, at the plug-in at the wall, then yeah, you'll, you'll obviously want to upgrade. But for the most, uh, most, most people out there, you know, it's not going to be as big of a deal. So, you know, do a little bit of research, do some reading, and really figure out what you want to do and, and how you want to go and uh, take a look what's what's in your budget. Do you have anything to add to that, Ryan? I do not. I do not. Well, this is a good summation of the power supply. This is stretching the memory back a bit, but <laughs> a long time ago when Lee used to be on the power or on the podcast wasn't one of mm-hmm. his favorite power supplies a PC power and cooling which was only a 12 volt rail with some uh, uh, voltage changers on it that actually supplied the 5 and the 3 volts or 3.3 yeah I think that's called a, a DC to DC uh, transformer mm-hmm. yeah yeah but uh, and that's and so pretty was, common on most of these higher end uh, power anymore so in theory, it's all essentially a 12 volt coming in there, and then there's a DC to DC transformer stepping it down or splitting it out to the different rails. Yeah, that seems to work well. I know that uh, some of the a lot of the newer ones all have that DC to DC yeah. instead of you know trying to get uh, three volt and five volt off of uh, the AC. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into voicemails here. Round out the show. We have uh, our first one coming from. Novell in Miami, Florida, if we have that ready to go. This is Novell from Miami, Florida. I have a little question. I have multiple hard drive controllers in my PC. One is on the motherboard, and another one is on an Asus um, SATA 6 card that I got. My question is this. I want to get a, um, an SSD and plug it into the SATA 6 port, but is it okay to have some hard drives on one controller and other hard drives on another controller. Should I even be worried about this? Thanks. 
Love the show. Uh, no, the only reason you would need to be worried about that is if you want to do any kind of RAID configurations, they need to be on the same controller. Uh, so or you've assuming... got a Sandy Bridge motherboard. <clears throat> well, yes, if, if you have a Sandy Bridge motherboard, put them all on the external controller or the side of six ports. Um, no, I mean, you, you can spread them across all the different controllers. The only things you run into, uh, like I said, are RAID configurations. Uh, they have to be in the same controller. Um, I personally like to have as few different controllers as possible in the system. It just seems to cause less complication. I mean, there's no driver issues, really. There's no operating system issues. It's just, for me, being able to route cables, uh, I've had instances where we've had, you know, 10 or 11 drives in the same system, uh, and that gets things pretty complicated. But, uh, no, there's there's no no problems using multiple SATA controllers. You know, chances are your motherboard already does that anyway because you've got the integrated SATA controller on your chipset plus any kind of Marvell or Promise or J Micron controllers that maybe do eSATA or IDE channels or anything like that. Those are already multiple storage controllers on your system. So I think uh, I think you have no problems and you'll be good to go. All right, one more. We have another voicemail here from Trey Hi, from this Cleveland. Is Trey this is more Cleveland. of a theoretical question. So we'll go ahead. And uh, I have uh, something you might want to discuss while you're waiting for uh, – Sandy Bridge hardware to come out for, for your reviewing. <clears throat> so we've all heard about this uh, computer that can play Jeopardy, and we all know about uh, um, the computer that uh, beat the uh, grandmasters in chess. But uh, we know that these are they're huge machines sucking down lots of power, and I just thought it would be interesting uh, what it would take... Um, if we leveled the playing field a little bit and uh, limited the computer's power usage to about what the human brain uses. And uh, I did a little research online and found the human brain uses uh, about 20 watts, equivalent of caloric energy. And uh, I guess that's a little bit more than a pad or maybe a a small laptop, uh, if you don't include the monitor. And... uh, how those uh, types of hardware would fare in, in a contest with human. Thanks. Now, this is like theoretical physics questions. This might not be the best mm-hmm. place for us um, uh, to, to venture into, but because of all the excitement that Watson was generating, uh, by the way, what is Toronto? Now we know how to trick all of the machines when Skynet takes over. But the I still the question, know move, worth moving to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Well, I mean, did you see? Did you see the how Watson screwed up on one of the episodes of, yeah. of Jeopardy? The category was U.S. cities, and regardless of what the what the question was, his answer was, "What is Toronto?" Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't see that. I'm sorry. That's that's really funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we know how to trick them now. We just you know, use a little double entendre in our in our language uh, for the question. But I guess the question is here. What do you think we could get out of a 20-watt computer close to this? Obviously, I mean, they did pre... Uh, if you watched these three episodes, they talked a lot about the systems, and we're talking huge hundreds of processors, uh, hundreds of terabytes of, of storage, if not petabytes, huge refrigeration machines keeping everything running. Not Probably, probably a little bit over 20 watts of power consumption. Um, I don't know. Do we want to talk about how long you think it will take? Till you can get uh, that same computing power into something maybe the size of uh, this ThinkPad here? Well, uh, according to what uh, ours had linked to earlier this week, uh, Feb 11th, I believe it was, they're essentially guessing that all of the computational power on the planet right now uh, digital signal processors, micro- microcontrollers, CPUs, GPUs, Essentially, every piece of silicon on the planet, its calculation power equals a human brain. Uh, just, you know, doing rough MIPS calculations. Hmm. So that's how big the silicon is right now. you got to shrink it down now. But we have hit the point, essentially, <laughs> where... Maybe, maybe, this is, maybe this shows my... Um inability to believe in a human race uh i find it hard to believe that it takes that much computing power to match what one human brain can do 
Yeah, but you're walking. Because you, you've never traveled down south, have you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, they're, they're talking yeah. about not just thought, but you're walking, you're processing uh, sure. optical light signals into your eyes through the optical nerve, yada, yada, yada. You're processing sound. Gotcha. You know, it, even just, you know, basically touch. You can feel the air around you, and whether it's warm or not. Right. That's and you're right, where the vast majority all, all of the instructions Watson are. Computer, all this, and all, you're right, all those different things are, are very complex. You look at the robots uh, that have trouble walking upstairs even after decades of, of development, and all this machine is supposed to do, the only job it has is to understand natural language. And it, as we show with what is Toronto, it still can't do it. After four years and I don't know how many millions of dollars put into this by IBM, still can't do it. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of processors with uh, almost limitless amounts of data, you know, pre pre inserted into it. So, uh, well, they just cross cross referenced Hades, Toronto, and the U.S. in the same place. Well, there you go. Got to be more complex than that, I guess. Josh, any more thoughts on this very inquisitive voicemail? <laughs> Boy, you know it. Uh, I'm going to be curious what uh, where we're at in you know in 20 years. Not just you know how much processing power can be you know held in my my fingernail, but how we're going to get over some of the physical limitations of of silicon and copper on silicon and uh, optics, and how we're going to go there. So. Uh, you know, everybody's saying, hey, within the next 20 years, we can have, you know, some, you know, 150-watt CPU that can mimic a brain. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of scary, intimidating. But there people get paid a whole lot more or smarter than me that makes these decisions, or at least I hope. <laughs> I hope they're smarter than you, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, again, podcast at PCPer.com, the email address, one eight 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 thirty eight pc per. Uh, toll free, uh, US and Canada, leave us a voicemail, maybe even something. Doesn't have to be specifically hardware related. Uh, very good question, uh, from both Novell and Trey there. Last week, we had a little contest. All you had to do was send an email in to podcast at pcper.com to win a Thermaltake Black X 5G USB 3.0 docking station. Unfortunately, Jeremy and Josh, you did not win. Uh, the actual winner was Chris Heimbuck. I hope I'm saying that last name right from, Wayzada, Wayzada, Minnesota. So uh, congratulations. I've already got your address. Hopefully you still live there because this will be uh, on its way to you very soon. C- congratulations. Uh, did you guys, uh, Jeremy, Josh, did you guys enter the contest? You know, I, I did not. Uh, I'm, not I'm still waiting for mine. <clears throat> Although okay. I'm supposed to be getting one any day now. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Somebody said in the chat room, uh, in 10 years, the show PC Perspective will actually be hosted by PCs. And I hope I hope. Oh no, we'll never be politically correct. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hardware software picks of the week. Mine is a software pick for cell phone users, specifically Android cell phone users. I have two selections for you. Uh, one is called My Backup Pro, and this is all happening to me because my phone went into an infinite loop today, infinite reboot loop. Had to re- factory restore it. Lost all of my settings. Uh, the last backup I had done was from sometime in August, so I had lost a lot of data, had to reinstall applications, uh, reset up a bunch of things. My Backup Pro, and the other one is called Titanium Backup, will uh, completely back up your system and restore it. Now, the key here is, as I learned today, is if you have a rooted system, a rooted phone, which is very, very easy to do now on these phones, as I figured out uh, earlier today, then it will restore everything, all the links, all the uh, the way your menus were set up, all the data for any applications that don't even if they don't specifically uh, have backup methods on them. You know, it will basically let you do a complete restore and a complete backup. Uh, highly recommended because you never know when your phone, uh, when you turn it on in the morning, will go into some infinite loop and you'll want to throw it out the window. But instead, you'll just do a factory reset on it. So. Um, uh, my pick of the week is remember to back up all of your devices. We've talked about Carbonite for your PCs and your Macs, uh, and I would say uh, back up your cell phones, although Jeremy and Josh are the wrong people to have in this conversation. So many people depend on their cell phones for every bit of their life now uh, that you need to be taking just as much care of this as anything. Jeremy, you have a PC game for us? Well, it, it's a bit of a 
story, but uh, I've been following an uh, indie group that's making a game called Shattered Origins, which, you know, the screenshots look like a very, very pretty space shooter. Finally released a demo today, and it's the push the forward button, and the second you stop accelerating, you stop dead in space, which bugs the hell out of me living in a Newtonian universe. On that same page, I spotted something called Free Space Evolution, which is, hey, a mod, which is an expansion of the Free Space Descent universe, which you have to love. If you've never played Free Space, find it, do whatever you have to do to make it compatible with Win 7, play it. It's the best space Good shooter games. pretty much Goodoldgames.com. Yeah. Actually, you can probably pick it up uh, for dirt, dirt cheap. But, yeah, I like found out, five- but I found out that this Free Space Evolution was actually a mod of a game called Nexus, the Jupiter Incident, which was released out in Germany, and I'd never heard of the bloody thing, which is like mm. a very large-scale fleet sim. So you've got a very large battleship, but it doesn't swoop around the universe. It's very heavy and takes a long time to turn. <laughs> and it's 10 bucks on Steam. So I would like a holiday. My pick is a holiday so that I can download Nexus the Jupiter Incident from Steam to play it through, because it looks brilliant, to turn it into Free Space Evolution so that I can play that. And I also noticed that someone's redone Freelancer updated the game engine and made a mod called Free Worlds Tides of War, which is supposed to turn into a more persistent universe with a bit of an economy and something to do other than fly around in the sort of boring Freelancer that I'm sure most people have done. Uh, you're not getting a holiday from me, so just so you know. Damn it! Got to keep, got to keep, got to keep, uh, got to well, keep the, the site running. So he just waits two weeks and he has another holiday. <laughs> True. Oh, it's a long uh, stretch. We got to go all the way to Easter. <laughs> well, apart from my annual Jeff? Monday after Super Bowl holiday. Yeah, we need one of those. Josh, Josh, you're up. Josh, that's me. Josh. Okay, yes, uh, Josh, yeah. sir. Ed has just released the new TX V2. Um, I've been using these actually in the test beds uh, for the past two years, probably, and uh, they've they've never given me a hiccup. They all had the you know the single uh, large rail on the twelve volt. Uh, they've just been fantastic. You know, pretty quiet, well built. I mean, they're not. You know, when when you actually hammer into them with uh, stuff like Lee does or hard OCP. They don't always look so great, but for the price that you pay and uh, the experience that I've had with them, the Corsair ones are, are pretty good. And now they have the next generation versions of these less expensive TX uh, power supplies. You can get a 750 water for 99 bucks. I think that's a, that's a pretty swell deal. Uh, these are all 80 plus bronze and, uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's uh, they look interesting, and uh, they they seem to be a you know a nice improvement from what was you know kind of a classic. There you go. Uh, Alan's not here. His pick is non-exploding PC components, or uh, non-leaking water cooling equipment. <laughs> So look that stuff up if you can. Uh, <laughs> let's see. That's going to be it for the show. Again, podcast at PCPer.com, 1-888-38-PC-PER. PCPer.com slash podcast is the address to share with all your friends. Uh, post on any forums that you might visit that maybe want updates on computer information, PC hardware, um, what's the latest and greatest in, in the world of hair products from Jeremy or Josh. Or me. Too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Ryan Shrout. You can find the site, twitter.com slash PC per Facebook, all those types of places. Uh, we want to thank you for hanging around another week, just as we have done. So we're going to end the show with that. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hallstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. Thanks for listening. See you next week. <laughs>